to order. Good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you so much for your patience. Um, this is a public hearing of the Joint Committee on Higher Education. That back feed is hard. Um, my name is Joe Comerford. I'm, uh, I, I have the honor of representing the Hampshire Franklin Worcester District in the Massachusetts State Senate. With me today is my uh, co-chair, Representative David Rogers, who represents Arlington, Belmont, and Cambridge. Um, first, I'm going to welcome the Senate committee members, uh, Senators Edward Kennedy, Paul Mark, Pavel Payano, and Bruce Tarr. They are the Senate members of the Joint Committee on Higher Education. I'm grateful for their partnership and their service. They may be joining us either in person or remotely. Um, as many of you know, because you come to hearings often, House members and Senate members are in and out. Uh, I'm going to invite the House Chair to recognize House members. Mr. Chair. Well, good morning and thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, and I would like to introduce the House members of the committee who are here. Uh, first, to my left, the Vice Chair of the committee, Representative Carmen Gentile. Also, um, to, uh, to his left, Representative Sean Garbley. Uh, and also, uh, joining us uh, online uh, are um, Representatives Ryan Hamilton, Representative Rodney Elliott, and Representative Patricia Duffy. So thank you all for being here, and I'll turn it back to my co-chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. So today, friends, we're going to hear testimony on 28 bills concerning student aid. This is a continuation of the hearing held on July 18th that was interrupted by the fire at the State House. On behalf of uh, Chair Rogers and myself, I want to thank everyone uh, for their quick response to the fire alarm that day, uh, for your, if you were here, for your, um, your quick exit of the building, and now for your patience as we found time to resume that hearing, that July 18th hearing. Um, I will note at the top of this hearing that the substance of several of these bills concerning in-state tuition for non-citizens was they were enacted into law as Section 11 of the fiscal year 2024 budget. And so several people have signed up to testify on that issue. We welcome your testimony, but I do want to just note that context. So before we proceed, um, just a reminder to mute your Teams app if you're online, and welcome to those who are virtual. Um, if you are not speaking, and of course, I will remind myself to turn off the ringer on my phone um, and to others in the room as well. So as with many committees, um, we take legislators out of turn and other dignitaries out of turn. Um, and this is because, again, they may be testifying at multiple hearings um, during a particular day. And after we hear testimony of an individual or a panel, I, I'll be delighted to recognize colleagues for questions um, of each speaker or panel. Um, so just so we know and so the folks are prepared, uh, we will wait for the entire panel to conclude before asking questions. I will look for raised hands online, but for our colleagues uh, who are coming in remotely, please do just jump in and ask a question uh, so that uh, we are not missing your question if I miss it. Um, for those testifying in person or remotely today, um, this committee requests respectfully three minutes of testimony, um, and we will help you find an appropriate endpoint if you exceed that three minutes. Uh, thank you to LIS, uh, committee staff and interns for helping run today uh, so well. Thank you to my legislative director, Brian Rossman, um, who is here today uh, and will be listening remotely. If there is additional written testimony uh, that you would like to submit uh, for the committee to consider, or if you didn't already submit it um, and you plan to testify today, please just send it by email. We are delighted uh, with written testimony. Thank you to the uh, committee and to all of our colleagues on the uh, committee staff and all of our colleagues on the committee for reviewing that. The instructions are on the hearing notice at malegislature.gov. Uh, uh, for, the, for the higher education hearing, um, the, there are instructions for how to submit that written testimony under the hearings tab. If you are testifying remotely, please just remember to only unmute when you are going to speak. Um, and then if you can, just because it helps teams actually work a little bit better, if you can exit the team site um, once you have offer testimony that will help 
um, sometimes some delay, you can always follow us uh, live. Um, so we're not blocking you from the hearing, we're just uh, blocking you from that team's interface, or um, not blocking, re respectfully requesting. Um, and it'll reduce the load on teams. So we're going to start now um, uh, with Representative uh, Rita Mendez, who's here with us. We then have followed by Representative Mindy Dom, who is testifying online, and we will get to the list of folks who are signed up to speak. Welcome, Representative. Thank you so much. Um, good morning. So I am Rita Mendez, and I represent the city of Brockton, and I'm here today testifying in support of um, H 3867, which um, this piece of legislation is very important to me. I have a 17-year-old son, and now we're going through that amazing time of picking the school he wants to attend and making sure that um, he's filling up his application correctly and doing his SATs, doing all that amazing stuff. And I am just so honored and happy to be by his side during that crucial moment in a child's life. That wasn't the case when I was 16 years old and I was attending Brockton High School. I didn't have a guardian, I didn't have a parent, I didn't have a responsible adult taking care of me. I was all alone and um, I was attending Brockton High School and after school I was working at Dunkin' Donuts until very late, closing the store and I was at a moment in my life that I was about to quit high school, except for one person at that high school that took interest in me, um, saw that I was going through this crisis in my life, that I wasn't a bad kid, that my grades weren't bad, and I didn't think that education wasn't important. It was just the circumstances that I was going through in my life that it was very challenging, that I was very lost, and I, had, I saw no way out. Somehow, my Spanish teacher who became my mentor and my guidance counselor saw that although I was quiet, I was screaming for help. And she helped me find a place to live. She helped me uh, get my driver's license, but most importantly, she didn't let me quit high school and she made sure that I attended Massasoit Community College free of charge. I don't know what she did. She helped me with scholarships, with grants, applications, whatever it was, she held through my hand and made sure that I accomplished that major step in my life. Today I can say that I not only have an associate's degree from Massasoit, I have a bachelor's degree from UMass Dartmouth, and I have a Juris Doctor degree from New England Law, and I'm here today having a seat at the table at this very important institution advocating because my story is not just unique to me. My story continues to repeat itself every single day in our public schools, especially in gateway cities where many kids are going to school and they have to work after school, not because they want to have some extra money to buy things for themselves, but because they really need to provide for themselves and their families and working is not an option, but it's an obligation. And a lot of times these kids are facing with that situation, whether they have to really pay for that fundamental education. So I'm here today, I'm very happy that we passed the Mass Reconnect that allows 25 and older to attend community college free of charge. And also I'm very happy that Brockton schools allow the dual enrollment that many kids are able to graduate with a high school diploma and the um, degree from community college. But it still leaves a gap for those that can't do that dual degree while attending school because they've got so much more happening in their lives. And I'm really here to advocate for those who are left out. And I hope we can pass it favorably and thank you for listening. Thank you so much representative for that really moving testimony and for your unbelievably courageous life story and your work to get where you are because we need you here um, to lead us on these important issues. Um, questions from the committee? I would echo what my uh, Senate co-chair said. I mean your personal story is incredible and uh, to think the challenges you faced and here you are as a representative of the people. So. Uh, uh, it's a remarkable story. The committee research director also went to UMass Dartmouth, and uh, so um, your story is great, and obviously we'll give the legislation a very careful look. As you probably know, we do have college, uh, community college for those 25 and older now, the Mass Reconnect, and are exploring expanding that statewide. Um, uh, in fact, the senator and I are, are on an advisory panel that's looking at that very issue. So. 
Uh, but thank you very much for your testimony and your inspiring story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next up, uh, please, we have Representative Mindy Dom. Okay, we'll come back to Representative Dom. She intends to join. Uh, is Senator Michael Moore on? No. No, okay. We'll come back to the Senator. Okay. President Lane Glenn. Okay. Not online. Uh, I also want to recognize another uh, House member uh, on the committee who just joined us, Representative Armini. Good Welcome. Morning. Good morning. All right, friends, for the folks who I've called and are not uh, yet on, we'll catch them on the flip side, as we say. Um, Judy Walter, please. Is Judy with us? My name is Judy Walter. I live in Northfield. Um, and uh, that's Franklin County, and I'm very grateful that Senator Joe Go uh, Comerford represents us in Boston. I'm so sorry, I can't be there in person, but I had to get my granddaughter off on a school bus at 825. Like many grandparents raising grandchildren, I am single parenting. We sacrifice our freedom, our resources, and our time for hobbies and passions, friends, volunteer work, and our other grandchildren. It wasn't exactly my plan for retirement. I raised two daughters. One is a doctor. The other, just as smart and talented, is an addict. Sophia is eight and a half, and she has lived with me since she was two in what I thought was a temporary arrangement. Now I have permanent guardianship. Sophia is a miracle. She is normal despite her in utero drug exposure, and her mother was using two bundles of heroin a day, that's 20 bags, and an early life of uh, multiple shelters and exposure to violence, including her father beating up her mother uh, for which he was incarcerated for a number of years. She is a good student and has no intellectual, psychological, behavioral, or physical problems. She is full of life, she is very wise for her age. I apologize. Her mother has cost the state many tens of thousands of dollars in multiple incarcerations, police interventions, rehabs, hospitalizations, subsidized housing, DCF interventions, AFDC, food stamps, methadone maintenance. Too much focus of the state's response to the opioid epidemic has been overdose prevention instead of addressing the collateral damage, especially to families and mostly to children. I am not one to complain or beg, but let's do the math. I am grateful to receive 500 and some dollars a month from Massachusetts. That brings our income for two people to $2,000 a month. This allows Sophia to have piano lessons, summer camp, and winter skiing with her school program. Still, our clothes are from Salvation Army and we rarely go on a vacation or uh, eat in a restaurant. But I receive far less than foster parents receive. And who knows, she could have bounced around in that system. Again, let's do the math. I am 75. I'll be in my 80s raising a teenager. I will be 85 when Sophia should be going to college and when those payments end. I have meager savings to, re to last the rest of my life. Foster children who have already cost the state more than my granddaughter has uh, receive free college tuition. And why shouldn't my granddaughter? Thank you. Judy, I want to thank you for your courageous testimony. I'm proud to represent Northfield and you and your daughter uh, and your granddaughter. Um, and I, I guess I would start by saying there's no need to apologize to anyone. The opioid crisis is ripping through the Commonwealth and it isn't a personal failure. Addiction isn't, as you know, a personal failure. Um, and we have every reason 
to come to the aid of your daughter. Um, and this is a much larger issue, although for you I know it is quite pressing and personal. It's a state responsibility. And I'm so sorry for the hardship that you and your daughter and your granddaughter have faced in the face of this unbelievable crisis. Um, and in terms of the bill that you're advocating for, uh, you know, I want to say that I, I so much appreciate grandparents raising grandchildren, calling this committee's attention to this pressing issue. I'm a mom who adopted our two children, my wife and I, and I know Rep Garbley is also interested in this issue. Um, we have a lot of benefits and safety nets for kids who come out of uh, DCF, but not uh, the same measure of attention for grandparents raising grandchildren. Um, so I just want to thank you for that, for drawing our attention once again to this issue. Any other questions from my thank colleagues? You. Thank you. I see none. Judy, thank you for getting on, and I really appreciate you. Someday bring Sophia to the State House. <laughs> we, can a, we can have a tour. Uh, okay. Um, next up, please, uh, is John Lepper here? Is on Zoom? Okay. Mr. Lepper? Uh, good morning, Chair. Can you hear me? We can, uh, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, good morning, Chairman Comfort, uh, Chairman Rogers, members of the committee. I'm here to testify on 1257 and 819, uh, House 1257 and Senate 819, which would provide tuition and fee waivers at, for Massachusetts residents who are subject uh, to legal guardianship upon reaching the age of 18 or upon enrolling in the Massachusetts Institute, uh, Institution of Higher education. I strongly support these bills. I was privileged to be a member of the House between 1995 and 2008. During that time and actually in, uh, before that, in 1988, uh, my wife and I were raising two granddaughters. They came to us because of that, my, my daughter's uh, drug addiction and uh, alcohol abuse and uh, and so we went to the probate and family court and, re and received a, a guardianship for them. A DCF was not involved in this. They were eight months old and two and a half, and they stayed until they were college graduates. Uh, it's important to know that there are 10,000 grandparents raising grandchildren in the Commonwealth without their parents present in the household. And um, these grandparents, and other kid caregivers step up, step up to do the do this work because of mental illness on the parts of the of the parents, incarceration, death, and of course, as has already been noted, the scourge of addiction. It's well documented that the kids that are under the jurisdiction of of, of, of parent care of of uh, relative caregivers do much better than than those that do uh, have to be placed in non relative foster, foster homes. I filed the bill that ultimately became the Grandparents Commission. Uh, it was evident to me that to improve government assistance uh, in general, uh, they needed to better understand the circumstances and the scope of, of these of caregiving, of kinship caregiving. It became law in 2008 when the Senate Chair of the Children and Families Karen Spilker incorporated it in a, into a much larger piece of legislation on child abuse and neglect. It's important to emphasize that the state assistance available to DCF foster parents and the children for whom they are, are, are largely, uh, is largely unavailable to, uh, uh, un, unavailable to the, uh, those who take the initiative to take, to do, to, um, to, uh, and go to probate and family court on their own. This includes stipends, uh, financial stipends, legal assistance, closing allowances, and so forth. A recent study done by the Chan Medical School at UMass uh, concluded, quote, although gaining recognition, the needs of these families, especially those not involved with ECF, really re remains largely uh, 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 unaddressed. 
the health, uh, new, both by health and human services, education and legal systems, uh, and both the at the bat, both the national and state level. Um, this legislation, uh, case in point, is Chapter 15A, Section A, which this these bills would address. I know I'm out of time, but let me just conclude by saying that. Uh, 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 th this is a very important piece of legislation for people that, like the woman who just spoke, because they take on this responsibility when they're elderly, perhaps, uh, you know, even have health issues themselves, and certainly no savings in, in, to be able to take care of a college education. So please, this is a matter of equity. Send this bill on for, uh, for a pot with a positive re recommendations and let ways and means do their thing in trying to make this a, a part of our of our uh, bill thank you john thank you so much for your service to the commonwealth and for testifying today uh, and for calling again calling us to attend this critical critical issue um, you mentioned a chan study can you submit that yeah. to, can you submit that to the committee Perhaps colleagues have read yes, that. Yes, I, I think it may have already been submitted, but we certainly we certainly can submit that to the committee. Absolutely. Very good. All right. Thank you so much for your testimony. Questions? I don't see any, but I see a lot of nodding heads. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you so much. Next You're welcome. person up is Devin Lanson. And I'm going to not do this last name well. Ali, Aline? Oh, thank you. Forgive me. For, how do you pronounce your last name? Aline, okay, very good. Oh. oh, terrific, yes, how wonderful. I see. And Mr. Alanson, so Jerry. Jerry and Devin, please. Good afternoon, my name is Devin Lanson Aline. You're, you're perfect, you're actually perfect. When I was seven years old, I could not read. I was in a school district at the time that refused to give me any learning disability or test me accommodations. That is why in the second grade, I originally enrolled with my grandparents. My grandmother is a learning disability specialist and my grandparents lived in Lexington, which has some of the best schools in Massachusetts. After I moved in with my grandparents, I got the IEP testing that I needed and was diagnosed with dyslexia. Then I got the accommodations I needed to do well in school. By the second trimester of the 10th grade, I was a straight A student and was on the honor roll all year. I spoke at a social justice conference and participated in Molly's Web. Originally, I was supposed to live with my grandparents for only a year or two to catch up in school. However, I've been living with them for almost nine years now. I ended up staying for so long because of my mother, who has struggled with substance abuse, mental illness, and abusive relationships, and could not take care of me anymore. And I have not seen my father in many years. College is a place I definitely plan on going to. However, this is not the case for other kids I've met who live with their grandparents. For some, having a chance to go to college for free could be the difference between going and not going. And many of the kids I know who live with their grandparents cannot afford to pay. This is mostly because being a grandparent and raising a grandchild is a tremendous financial strain on a grandparent, especially those who are retired. Kids who are in the foster care system get free state college tuition. It doesn't seem fair that kids who are living with their grandparents cannot. They are in a similar position to the kids in the foster care system. And that is why I think children living with their grandparents should get free tuition to state colleges and universities. I urge you to support the college tuition and fee waiver bill, House Bill 1257 and Senate Bill 819. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Just if you could turn Hi. your mic. <clears throat> Honorable committee members, it's always hard to follow my granddaughter. It's impossible, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> impossible to follow that testimony. Uh, my name is Jerry Lanson. Um, my granddaughter and I drove from Falmouth on Cape Cod. We left at quarter of seven this morning. That's how important we consider this bill. Devin first came to live with my wife, Kathy, and me in 2014. She was struggling with reading, as she said. And we brought her to Lexington School so she could catch up. We also wanted to give her mom, our daughter, time to focus on other issues other issues with which she was dealing. Nine years later, Devin still lives with us, now uh, in Falmouth on Cape Cod, where we moved in 2018. Devin caught up in school just fine, as she told me. But her mother's mental health got worse, and she's also struggled with substance abuse issues with the 
Chem Devon's legal guardian in 2016. Today, we rent a nearby apartment for her mother and maintain a car for her. She's not worked in four years. And now she has physical problems as well. Devon's father provides no support. Despite all this, Devon has flourished. We think she's a terrific kid, as you can see. She's hardworking, smart, resilient, creative, funny, engaged, and determined. There's no question that she's going to college. The question is how she and we will pay for it. Kathy and I had professional careers. She's an independent school administrator, and he's a professor. Uh, we didn't anticipate the kind of cost we're carrying now. At 74, I still work part-time as a writing coach. Nonetheless, we're draining our retirement savings at what is an unsustainable rate. Other grandparents we know are in worse shape. Some work full-time uh, to meet their grandkids' needs. Some are widows. Some have no backup. They have no safety net. All our grandkids have had to endure a lot. Some have lost parents to the opioid crisis. Some have been exposed to domestic violence. Some have witnessed substance abuse. All have suffered loss in their lives. Yet those cons uh, considering college have prevailed. That's really important. They're achievers, possibly future leaders. By supporting House Bill 1257 and Senate Bill 819, you can help them take a huge step forward you can give them the same opportunity foster kids have under state law right now, and you should. I urge you to. Without this bill, many of the kids won't go to college. They'll be scared off by the massive debt they face, or they won't want to burden their aging grandparents anymore. Investing in them is not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. Because in the long run, they will repay the state as educated, appreciative, and valuable. Devin and Jerry, thank you so much for your courageous testimony and thank you for coming in person to talk with us. There is no doubt, Devin, that you are on to unbelievable things. And Jerry, to you and your wife, thank you. Um, what you're facing and what you've already triumphed through says everything this committee needs to know about who you are as a person. Um, and you know, you are a leader now. Um, how old are you? I'm 16. 16. At 16, goodness knows what you're going to become, right? Because you're so powerful in your testimony. Um, one thing for this committee just to know and for you to know, we, we still continue to shortchange kids who are in foster care. We have two words, it's called state supported. Um, and that means the kids have to take courses during the day with full-time professors in order to get the benefit um, that you're, you're asking that you get as a, as a individual being raised by grandparents. So we are, we are, we are imperfect in the, in the foster care system as well, and certainly wholly imperfect in how we're treating young people who are being raised by their grandparents. Um, questions from the committee? Not so much a question, but just to echo what my co-chair said. Thank you so much for the testimony, for braving the traffic from the Cape at 7 in the morning. And it was very powerful testimony, Devin, and, and, uh, and um, so uh, we really appreciate hearing from you, and um, um, so thank you. Thank you all so much. Have safe travels back. Thank you. All right, next up, please, we have Audrey Fannin. Audrey Fannin? Yes, yes, good morning. Uh, my name's Audrey Fannin. I'm a 76-year-old grandmother who has had continuous custody of three grandchildren for the past 17 years. It's my privilege to testify before you this morning. My grandchildren came to live with my husband and I and our youngest children from very unstable situations. They all three were exposed to drugs and alcohol abuse, as well as domestic violence. Their baggage was extensive. Over the years, these kids have bloomed in the environment of consistency, safety, and family harmony. They have participated in sports of all kinds, church activities, community projects, 
and theater programs. They've received individual and group counseling and have worked hard in school in accordance with their IEPs and have achieved academic excellence. These kids have come a long way and now, in my estimation, deserve the opportunity to follow their dreams of becoming contributing members of society. Education is definitely the key. The passage of the college tuition and fee waiver bill would mean the world of difference for our family and for other families just like us. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Have a great day. Thank you so much for your important testimony uh, and for joining this hearing. Questions from the committee? I don't see any. Thank you again. And thanks for Thank your you. service. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to President Glenn um, from Northern Essex Community College here to testify in H1294 and S826. Good morning, Mr. President. Thank you. My apologies if I missed my first roll call. It is okay. Uh, it is morning, okay. Uh, we Chair said we would catch you. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Uh, good morning, Chair uh, Comerford and Chairman Rogers and Vice Chair Gentile and the other distinguished members of the Joint uh, Committee on Higher Education. Um, thank you for the time here this morning. As the president of New England's first federally uh, recognized Hispanic-serving institution with campuses in two gateway cities, uh, Papal and Lawrence, I strongly encourage you to support uh, House Bill 1294, an act to facilitate student financial assistance. Uh, Massachusetts is widely recognized as the most educated state uh, in the country. Nearly half of the adults uh, in the Commonwealth have a bachelor's degree or higher. And our workforce certainly continues to demand uh, those kinds of credentials. However, we're no longer keeping up. A recent study from Mass Inc. pointed out that the state is going to be nearly 200,000 college-educated adults short of the workforce that it needs by the year 2030. Even as high school graduation rates in Massachusetts have been climbing over the last 10 years, Fewer of those grads are going directly to college when they graduate. The rate plummeted from 73% in 2016 to only 63% in 2021. And the students who would most benefit from attending college are even less likely to go. The rate for black students has fallen to 56%, low income students to 45%, and Hispanic students to 39%. If we don't do something soon, we'll be lagging behind other states that are more competitive and really striving to get more of their high school graduates to college. One simple cost-effective step that we could take is to require completion of the federal financial aid form, the FAFSA, uh, as, a, as a requirement for high school graduation. The FAFSA determines whether a student is eligible for federal and state financial aid, as well as scholarships from colleges and foundations and other organizations. Seniors who complete the FAFSA are 84% more likely to enroll in college. The lowest income students which include large proportions of black, Hispanic, and rural students are 127% more likely to enroll in college. Those FAFSA completers are also more likely to persist and to graduate, which of course leads to better jobs, better security, better health benefits, uh, better health outcomes, and of course, contributing to the needs of the Massachusetts workforce. Right now, only about 61% of graduating high school students in Massachusetts are completing the FAFSA. Even that average is misleading. Uh, in mostly white, educated, more affluent communities, places like Arlington and Natick and Westford, more than 80% of students are completing the FAFSA, and not surprisingly, more than 80% of those students are going to college. In gateway cities like Brockton and Chelsea and Lynn, those cities with lower education levels, less money, uh, less educated adults, fewer than 50% of high school students are completing the FAFSA, and 40% Louisiana was the first state in the nation to require this in 2018. They now lead the nation in FAFSA completion, 74% of their graduates. They've also closed the gap between low income and more affluent communities. 13 other states have adopted something like this for the good of the workforce and for the good of the Commonwealth, and I encourage you to do the same thing for Massachusetts. Um, back in July, I testified on uh, Senate Bill 826, so I won't do that again this morning. I provided written testimony, happy to answer any questions. Did you provide your written testimony on this bill as well? I sent it to Rosalind uh, last night, so she has that. Uh, if you could send it to my office as well, that would be great. I will do that, Chair um, I, to Just to save Roz a trip. You bet. Um, thank you so much for your compelling testimony and your leadership in public higher education. I wonder if we could spend just a minute on persistence. Absolutely. I, I, I'm sure my co-chair and committee members are hearing this 
as a layered in part of our conversation, right? We have to make getting into college affordable and accessible, right. but then there's a persistence through college that I hear more and more, and I, I feel like we're hearing it in part because you all are calling us to it as leaders of these institutions, and the legislature is um, in this last budget cycle with the gov in partnership, of course, with Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll and the great Department of Higher Ed doing more focused work. Right. And so it feels like we're getting to a deeper level of conversation around public higher education. Right. Could you say more about what it is to persist on a campus? Happy to. When, when a student drops out of college, perhaps especially at a community college or a state university, but really at any institution, it's usually not because they don't get the math. It's not because of academic reasons. More often than not, it's personal reasons. It's healthcare, it's transportation, it's childcare, it's my job change shifts, it's financial. And to the extent that those students can get access to the financial support they need, which inevitably requires completion of the FAFSA, the persistence comes from having those resources, whether it's in the form of a Pell Grant, Mass Grant Plus, to the chair's point, uh, the state has done quite a lot in recent years to shore up Mass grant, state financial aid, um, and to provide other forms of support, uh, academic support, through something like the success program, where we still have some work to do is around uh, financial. It's estimated nationally that students leave about three and a half billion dollars of financial aid on the table each year by not completing the FAFSA. That's a national statistic. I don't have the Massachusetts statistic, but you can do the proportional math, right? It's tens of millions of dollars federal aid dollars mostly, but it's money that's already there, and it would help with the persistence. It would be something that would not cost the state anything <laughs> um, to do to make this change in requirements for high school graduation, but would net the state an awful lot in terms of student persistence and graduation. That's really helpful. I actually think it will cost us a little bit of money to do this, right, because we'll have to have Supports guidance counselors. Um, you know, at my Greenfield Community College, for example, they dedicate someone from the financial aid office to go to high schools in the area. She's dogged. You don't want to get between her and a FAFSA, <laughs> right? Because she, she, knows the, she knows what you're saying, right. President. Right. Um, who's opposed to this? Um, to your point, uh, it, there, there, I shouldn't have said it wouldn't cost the state anything. There are resources uh, involved in terms of staffing, and there may be some concern at the high school level an unfunded mandate if there isn't some support for that. You're right about that. Uh, I'm not aware of any organized Is there any opposition organized this. opposition? Uh, this, this bill uh, was presented by Representative Vargas a couple of years ago at the beginning of COVID when we saw FAFSA rates plummet. Yeah. It fell off precipitously at the beginning of COVID. Uh, Representative Vargas and, and uh, Representative Tyler presented the bill. And as I spoke to superintendents and others back then trying to rally support, there was some initial concern about that. It was a modest concern. It wasn't full on opposition. Um, other than that, um, I, I'm not aware of any opposition. Okay. All right. Very helpful. Questions from the committee? Please, Representative. Do we have a sense of price tag? I don't know. I haven't seen a study, a price tag study. Um, For the staffing? No. I, no. So it's really just, it seems it would just be staffing. Probably at the high school and college level, I would imagine, community college level. Right. I mean, honestly, um, <laughs> my own institution, I don't foresee the need to hire full-time staff to accomplish this. We have people who go out and do FAFSA workshops all the time. We could manage this ourselves. The high school might feel differently about that. It might need a little bit of support. Um, I'm not aware of a, an organized study to look at the price tag. Um, I, I can't imagine it would be uh, that size. Very helpful. Thank you. Any other questions, Representative? Th thank you, uh, Ma Madam Chair. Uh, this, this is a very worthwhile bill to, to provide financial assistance and we have we have other bills before us to provide financial assistance and uh, you know Massachusetts of course leads the leads the nation in, in, in uh, education and educating our residents here but we're still way behind our peers in, in Europe who have had free higher education essentially free higher education for 50 50 years now so that I have high school graduates in my district, and I'm, I'm confident that there are high school graduates in, in everyone's district that are in Europe today, in Germany, in Holland, in, in, in France, receiving free higher education. One of our, one of our colleagues in the house, one of my colleagues in the house grew up in my district, 
uh, Wayland and uh, went to France, free bachelor's degree. They paid half of her room and board, even, even, you know. So what's wrong with us here in Massachusetts that f higher education is not free? You know, in Germany, they have 16 states, and the average gross domestic product in each of those states is substantially less than the gross domestic product in Massachusetts. We have about 180, over 180 percent of the average gross domestic product that a German state has, and each of those states provides free higher education. Uh, I mean, I've got, I was talking to a, to a friend and, and uh, uh, constituent last night. His son got his bachelor's degree in, in Europe. Now he's getting his free master's degree, you know. And we're not doing it for our own residents. So these are all measures, all these bills, this bill and all these others are measures to, wouldn't it be so much simpler that you've got your college, you've got your high school diploma or your GED, you want to come to school? So, uh, and we also have legislation before this committee to, to try and do that as well. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Yeah. Would you like to comment on that or do you I'm sorry? Was it like go? Yes, I would. I would. I'll, I'll be brief. A lot yes, thank you. I'll, I'll yes. Um, yeah. I, as somebody who uh, yeah. started the country's first apprenticeship program for stage technicians in the Midwest many years ago, I'm familiar with the German apprenticeship model and some uh -huh. of those things. And the upside of what is happening in some countries in Europe is, as you've described, mm -hmm. uh, a free education for those who are able to access it. And there's a bifurcated system mm -hmm. where not everyone can get sure. at that education. Community colleges are an American invention. And to the extent that countries like Canada and Australia and others have adopted them, they've learned them from us. We have the only, the world's only uh, national system of open access higher education. So to some extent, that's how we started out trying to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. and, and Chair Comerford has certainly said this, and I believe Chair Rogers has as well. The challenge to any free community college program or free college program that has come along so far has been its ability to meet three criteria providing sufficient resources to students, providing sufficient resources to institutions, and sustainability. We're working on solving those problems right now, of course, right? The legislature provided some resources for us to work on that this year. Hopefully we can do that and get to a place, uh, Vice Chair Gentile, where we can do a better job of that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Uh, I believe we are joined now by Representative Dom, virtually. Rep. Dom? Yes, thank oh, you. Very good. Good morning. Good morning. You are warmly welcome. Thank you. Would you like me to testify now, Madam Chair? Absolutely. Oh, great. I'm also here as a member of the committee, so I'm very interested in the bills that we'll be hearing. Thank you. And good morning, Chair Rogers, Chair Comerford, and honorable members of the Joint Committee. I'm testifying this morning in support of H3761, an act reducing the cost of attending college, um, which would establish an open educational resource trust fund to provide grants to public higher education institutions for the development and distribution of OER materials. And for our shared understanding, open educational resources or OER are defined as learning materials that reside in the public domain and can be used and shared at no cost. So this is essentially finding faculty, creating curricula based on resources that are available online at no cost to them or students. Um, and then students obviously can access it for no cost. The price of textbooks is one of the hidden costs of higher education and can be an enormous barrier for students. This expense is often not covered by financial aid and prevents low income students from having the same opportunities as their peers. Many students do not buy or rent textbooks because of financial concerns, and this affects their performance in classes and undermines their academic success. And it's one of those examples where um, when I talk with people in my generation um, who graduated college potentially in the early 80s through to the 90s, they say, well, I don't remember textbooks being that expensive or my books not being that costly. And when we talk about what it now costs students, which can sometimes be up to $500 a semester, $1,000 a year, that's significant, especially when we're talking about students who may already be facing economic challenges. 
OER is a simple way to make higher education cheaper and more equitable. Investments in OER grant programs help students to graduate with less debt and provide all students with equal access to course materials. The financial savings generated by OER is draw dropping. For every $1 invested in grants to faculty, it's estimated that students can save between $10 and $20. Grant programs that were started during the pandemic have already saved two and a half million dollars, according to MassPerg's report, Open Textbooks, the Billion Dollar Solution, which I'm happy to share with the committee. Using OER also allows professors to more closely tailor their materials to their courses, something that would be impossible with traditional copyright, and thereby it makes those materials more relevant to the course topic and to the students and results in a better learning experience overall. The Department of Higher Education in Massachusetts has had an OER working group for some time. Um, and in 2019, they issued their final report, which recommended the expansion of OER programs across all public higher ed campuses in Massachusetts. The report identified stipends for faculty for the adoption, adaptation, and creation of OERs as one of the largest needs. We can't expect faculty to do this for free. Um, they need to get the additional stipends and sometimes time in order to do it. This bill seeks to address that issue and ensure that educators across all public higher ed campuses in the Commonwealth have the tools to make learning accessible and academic achievement attainable. OER is an effective intervention to increase the affordability of college, developing appropriate resources, utilizing best practices and lessons learned requires an investment in public resources. The trust fund creates a mechanism to support OER development and distribution. And if I may, Madam Chair, last session when I testified, you had asked some questions which I'd like to answer um, today. One was what happens to quality assurance of curriculum? And I want to assure you that the same method that's used to assure curriculum the traditional way is used in this way. And often OER curriculum have, goes through another layer because faculty rely, use, and collaborate with school librarians in order to access the materials. So it's often a team effort with people with various experience. You also asked how much would this cost to bring to scale? And we turned around and asked some experts that question and people didn't have a specific answer for that. Um, and I think most of that is because some classes don't lend themselves to OER. Either the materials don't exist or the textbook is actually the way to do it. And so to figure out, well, how much would it cost in an ideal world? Here's what we got as one potential scenario. Institutions, public higher ed institutions could focus on their general education courses the first two years, which would give them a great leg up in reducing um, the expense to college. And also those are the courses that have the most existing material online currently. And when they estimate how much would it move forward, they actually looked at how much um, Massachusetts has already saved with specific investments. So they said, well, if we applied $200,000 to each public higher ed institution, that would be about $6 million. And that might, that might generate a whole lot of savings for people. When you think that they estimate that DHE generated about $7.6 million in savings for students based on reporting from 17 out of 28 institutions that used $60,000, $60,000 in one fiscal year from DHE. So the saving potential here is huge. The investment will come back to us. It's, 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 not, it's going right into like students' rooms and hands in terms of reading and supporting faculty to develop the courses that they know are going to make the most sense for students. Thank you. I respectfully urge um, the committee to advance this wonderful bill. Thank you, Representative. Uh, and let me just say, because we share a town together and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, that you there is no better advocate for OER uh, statewide than you, Rep. Dom. Uh, and I'm really well, grateful. I actually share, I would, I appreciate that, Senator, but I, I think that the people that really deserve it here are like the DHE people who are working they with are the camp. Great people. Yeah, Mass Perg and the UMass Amherst librarians who are really sort of champions of this. Uh, 
Thank you, though. Thank you. And I, I, I also join you in that appreciation uh, for their great work. Uh, and I had two questions, right? Quality and how much? And you've already yep. answered them. <laughs> because you may be some mind reader on top of everything else. Uh, questions from my colleagues on the committee. Yes, please, Representative. Representative Baum, um, having just spent $700 on textbooks for my son. <laughs> ah, thank you. A, a more recent estimate is available. <laughs> Sure, but my brief, um, what I'd like to do is do it briefly here and then get you a more detailed piece through these reports afterwards, because my brief description is not going to provide you with all the checks and balances that are in OER and all the efforts that librarians and faculty have made to really sort of professionalize it and make it not only something that can pass academic muster and is beneficial to students, but is relatively not easy to put together, but um, user friendly to put together. So OER basically says, okay, so what's available with no copyright right now? If primarily available on the internet at no cost. There's articles, there are books, um, there are materials, there are curricula. How can faculty take what's already existing that's for free and include it in a curriculum? So as you know from your own experience, either personally or through your child's experience, they get a syllabus and maybe every week in that class, there's going to be readings that are assigned. There's going to be class assignments that are gonna be happening for the reading piece or for the viewing a video piece, however, whatever technology is going to be used. OER would, the faculty would work with a librarian to identify what's available to meet that curriculum learning need for free on the internet. And instead of getting a book on the syllabus, they might get a link on the syllabus, or they might have a QR code for the whole class that would then give them all the links. Um, so it's it's really sort of using what's currently available at no cost and then integrating it into a syllabus that a faculty person has decided this is this meets my academic goals. It's not taking what's available and squeezing it into the curriculum goals. It's saying, here's the curriculum goals, what's available that can meet it. So the academic part is really preserved. And I think that's the piece that we really have to keep in mind in terms of the quality assurance is we're not looking to um, get less than, we're just looking to make sure that what students get are available for free. Thank you, Representative. And Rep Dom, is it true that also some OER has um, has led to granting academics to create their own texts? That's another oh, yeah. piece. Right. There, there's Absolutely. another piece of this. And their own kind of course book, right, for yeah. the, the class. Um, I think the other piece of it is that faculty then also get to design their own tests and their own assessment for the class, which sometimes doesn't happen when they use publisher materials. They're getting tests that are already predetermined. So in that way, both the curriculum can not only be tailored to the students and to the faculty um, goals, but it can also, the assessment can be. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Seeing none, um, thank you, Representative. I know you're joining us virtually. Um, we will I am, thank you. To more testimony. Thank you very much. All right, we're going back to testimony on H12578S819, uh, um, an act relative to tuition waivers for children raised by grandparents or other relatives. Um, is Shauna Manning here? She's not here? Okay. Uh, how about. I'm here. Oh. I'm here. Okay, very good. I'm sorry. No, 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 sorry. Um. Okay. I couldn't get the mic off. No, no, um, please, no worries. I, I also, okay, um, my granddaughter is in school and I was asked to read her testimony as well. So I don't know if you wanted me to do it after mine so I could log off Teams. Um, you know, I think I, I, I will trust you here. Um, we, you can also submit the testimony in writing. Generally committees are um, less 
it's, it's not always effective to read other people's testimonies, given the numbers of folks signed up to testify. Um, but oh, okay. Why don't you okay, why don't okay. you test offer us your testimony and then we'll we'll see about your daughters. Okay. Um, so I am a grandparent raising my grandchild and I'm in support of age 1257s819. An article in the New York Times on October 3rd is titled Without a college degree, life in America is staggeringly shorter. The authors say that two thirds of American adults do not have a college degree. A four year college degree is the difference between Americans who are financially and socially secure and those who struggle throughout their lives. These struggles also translate into shorter lifespans by eight and a half years. Our grandchildren have struggled greatly through their childhoods. They've lost their parents as guardians and protectors. As grandparents, we've been fortunate to provide a somewhat safe landing for our grandchildren. We do all we can do to support and nurture our grandchildren. However, most of us are simply not equipped as senior citizens to pay for college. Many of our grandchildren, like my wonderful granddaughter, have IEPs at school to address learning disabilities and trauma that affects them academically. I know my granddaughter will do well at college, but she will need to focus all her efforts on her education. I ask the Commonwealth to invest in our grandchildren and their future lives by financially supporting them in public colleges and universities. I can't tell you what this will mean to grandparents who feel guilty for not having the money to, for, the, for college and their grandchildren who are entering adulthood after a difficult coming of age. What our grandchildren lack in finances, they make up for with grit, determination, and resiliency. The majority of our graduates from public higher education stay in the Commonwealth and work and pay taxes. This is truly an investment in our citizens, an investment that will pay off for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. We really so much appreciate uh, your courageous testimony here um, and your advocacy for your family and, your, of course, your granddaughter. Why don't you read her testimony so that we can hear her voice? Okay. <clears throat> My name is Cheyenne Manning, and I'm 16 years old. My papa and oma have been raising me since second grade. I am in 11th grade now. Before the second grade, my mom and I lived in 17 different places. I could not concentrate at school because my life was so hard. DCF took me from my mom. My papa and oma take the best care of me. I always have food to eat, clean clothes to wear, my own bedroom and help with school. My mom had a stroke and is in a nursing home. She's in a vegetative state. It is really hard because she is not alive and she is not dead. I see a therapist who has helped me a lot with my anxiety and PTSD. I had a really hard time my first year of high school with my mental health, but I have worked hard and am better now. I work really hard in school. I have a learning disability in reading and ADHD and anxiety. I'm doing well in school, but it takes a lot of time and work. My papa has always said he wants me to be somebody. Both my papa and Oma believe in me and my abilities. I wanna go to college. I know I will need to focus and work hard to go to school. DCF will help me pay for college. Without help from DCF, it would be hard for me to afford college. I know I can be somebody and make a difference in the world, and I need to go to college to make that happen. I wish all grandchildren being raised by their grandparents would have the opportunity to go to college and be somebody. I'm sorry for crying. Today, oh, is, today is Cheyenne's mother's birthday. <clears throat> So it's a little emotional. Of course it is. 
Of course it's emotional. <coughs> you know, when people like you and everyone in this room take the time to share your personal stories and your calls to action with this committee, you both open our hearts and you open our minds at the same time. And that's the power of democracy uh, and the power of these hearings. Um, so thank you. Please tell Cheyenne that we thank know you. she's going to be somebody. And we know she's a, a bright star, not unlike another bright star we had speak to us just a moment ago. Mm -hmm. um, they are the future of this Commonwealth, and we have to do right by them. So please tell her thank we, heard, you. we heard her voice today. I will. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I believe that Representative Dom has a question for you, Shauna. Rep Dom. Shauna, I don't, Shauna, I don't have a question. Yes. I, I just wanted to say thank you. I want to thank you not only for the love and care that you're showing in your family, but for bringing it to our attention and sharing it with us. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see no other questions, Shauna and Cheyenne, uh, through Shauna. Thank you so much. The next okay. is um, Aline Mitchell, please. Aline, I believe, is virtual. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Good morning, honorable members of the Joint Committee on Higher Education. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Eileen Mitchell, and I'm currently the chair of the Commission on the Status of Grandparents Raising Grandchildren, and I'm here to testify in strong support of H1257 and S Senate 819. I probably will be repeating some of the things you've heard already, but just want to give you a little bit of overview. The Commission, with the support of Representative Donato and Senator Sear, filed these bills to bring parity to children raised in the Commonwealth by their grandparents outside of the foster care DCF system. Your committee has been provided with a copy of a 2022 study by the UMass Chan School, which was commissioned to explore the inequities and resources available to families within the child welfare system and those outside of it. The vast majority of children being raised by grandparents are not in the foster care DCF system. Because those families are outside of the child welfare system, there are very few formal supports and services in place to assist them. At the same time, while not receiving much formal support from the state, these kinship families save the Commonwealth millions of dollars annually that would otherwise be spent on foster care and other payments. In addition, as you all know, to the financial subsidies for foster care grandparents, the children raised by those grandparents receive additional benefits, including the possibility of tuition and fee waivers at Massachusetts state colleges and universities under general law, chapter 15A, section 19. This bill would amend the current statute to include young adults who are being raised by grandparents or other kin outside of the DCF system who are subjects of legal guardianship. The Grandparents Commission hears from many grandparents raising grandchildren through support groups, workshops, and our annual conference. These grandparents express great concern about how they will be able to assist the grandchildren they are raising with college costs. As you've heard, many have already depleted their financial resources, including retirement accounts. The leadership of the Commission on the Status of Grandparents Raising Grandchildren has met with representatives of the Department of Higher Education in connection with the proposed legislation. The Department of Higher Education has significant experience administering tuition waivers through their tuition waiver program. We believe it will be possible to create an implementation process for this legislation like the one currently in place where students have been in foster care. The Commission on the Status of the Grandparents Raising Grandchildren strongly supports this legislation as part of our efforts to bring parity in resources and opportunities to the children raised by grandparents and other kids outside of the DCF system. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of this legislation. Thank you so much for your leadership on this issue. Questions from the committee? I see none. I just want to make sure, just for clarity, that we're all aware that uh, kids who are seeking higher education 
who are being supported and are currently in the foster care system are only able to get the free tuition um, if they are in a quote unquote, two words, state supported class. And state supported means full time, uh, nine to five, daytime hours, full time professor. And as more and more of our campuses have extended schedules and are taught by adjuncts, um, the young people seeking those classes are not offered uh, tuition and fees. It's just something that I, there is, I have a bill personally on this issue, but um, it's something for us just to be aware of. When we say that kids in foster care are getting uh, free college tuition, that is not the case um, fully. There is, there is a, what I call a loophole. Probably other people have better words for it. Um, but thank you so much. We appreciate your testimony. Okay, next up, please, we have Femi from U Aspire. Who's coming in virtually? Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you so much. Hi, I'm offering testimony on two bills. Should I offer, deliver both? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Thank good morning, you. Chair. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Comfort and Chair Rogers and esteemed members of the Joint Committee on Higher Education. I'm Femi Stoltz, the Massachusetts Policy Director at USPIRE. We are a Massachusetts-based nonprofit providing financial aid advising to nearly 5,000 low-income first generation and students of color in the Commonwealth. I am here in support of House Bill 1294, an act to facilitate student financial assistance, better known as the Universal FAFSA Bill. Students who complete the free application for federal student aid or FAFSA by the end of their senior year are 84% more likely to enroll in college than their counterparts who do not complete the FAFSA. Research has also shown that hands-on support for completing the FAFSA increases completion rates and that even small increases in financial aid can spur college enrollment. Furthermore, the states that have adopted similar legislation requiring FAFSA completion for graduating students have uh, resourced schools to support these students with FAFSA submission have seen significant increases in completion rates, particularly between low income and high income districts. Louisiana was the first state to implement a universal FAFSA policy and their policy closed the gap between their high income and low income states by 87% in just one year. Within two years, that gap had been completely closed. This particular piece of legislation gave really critical consideration to aspects related to equity, um, such as ensuring that students don't have to disclose citizenship status and ensuring that students who need support navigating the financial aid process can get that support through their district. It also includes really robust opt-out waivers and options so that students who have already made post-graduation plans can choose not to complete the FAFSA. Section two of the bill also creates a FAFSA fund, which would allow for lower income districts to be prioritized for funding once funds were allocated um, to help support students and families with the FAFSA. Massachusetts students deserve equitable access to information about financial aid and House 1294 stands to help students who might otherwise see post-secondary education as out of reach to them due to financial concerns might help them understand their aid eligibility and make them see that college actually is an option for them. I respectfully urge you to report this bill favorably out of the committee uh, to help further the Commonwealth's commitment to equity for our students. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, did you have testimony on another bill as well? <laughs> I did. Uh, I am also here in support of House 1261, Senate Bill 813, an act improving access to affordable higher education. Um, in an effort to distribute limited funds in a really targeted manner, the Commonwealth has created more than 40 small grant programs, scholarships, and tuition waivers. And while this was perhaps well intentioned, it has created a really unnecessarily complex and confusing financial aid system for students to navigate. The process itself can end up creating barriers for students who arguably stand to benefit the most from accessing state aid and from accessing public higher education. Most other states have one primary financial aid program with a few smaller targeted grants for specific populations. 
These elements contribute to a complicated system for students and families to navigate here and the completion of a detailed review and streamline of our current system that includes the perspectives of financial aid experts, colleges and universities, and most importantly, students and families will ensure that a comprehensive redesign leads to a financial aid system that is equitable, transparent, and simpler for students and families to navigate. So on behalf of US Fire and the students across the Commonwealth, we ask that you also report these bills favorably out of the committee. Thank you so much, both for your work and this testimony. Uh, the work of US Fire is so critical statewide. Thank you. Um, questions from the committee? I just have one. Please. Thank you. On the, um, I, on the, um, the question of the FAFSA, what we also know <coughs> is that if there isn't follow through once students are actually in an institution of prior learning, that they often uh, will drop out because you know they get tripped up by small things like filling out the FAFSA for the second year or the third year. And is there any in any of these programs or, or the way it's conceived? Is there any follow through beyond that initial first filing? Yes. Yeah, so I sent um, some additional member uh, some additional materials to the committee earlier this morning. So um, some of the other states that we're looking at, like Louisiana, do have follow through beyond just that first year. So both have support through both high school and college to continue offering support for students, um, which I think probably contributes to their ability to persist um, from from year to year and ultimately graduate. Um, but I have a lot more resources that I sent along to the committee that I'm happy for you to take a look at. Thank you, Representative. Great question. And Femi, wouldn't you also say that the success fund, as it's currently being implemented, so the success at, at community college level, has wraparound supports um, that help with persistence? And persistence being, as uh, President Glenn, Femi, I don't know whether you were on, talked about, you know, that is often financial. Um, yes. They do have folks in, the, in that kind of casework capacity. Yes. Currently, not in the four years. And so that's a that is a gap that's been identified, but it's it's good to make these connections for sure. All right. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, next up, please. I have Bahar from Hildreth. Is Bahar here? Hello. Oh, there you are. Yes. How are you all? Good. Thank you so Hello. much for joining us. Thank you for having me. First, I'd like to, of course, extend my thanks to Chair Comerford, Chair Rogers, Vice Chair Gentle, and the distinguished members of the Joint Committee on Higher Education for the opportunity to speak to you today in support of an act improving access to affordable higher education, S. Uh, 813 and H. Uh, 1261. So my name is Barak Manimboden, and I'm representing the Hildred Institute and uh, students of Massachusetts. We are a research and a policy center committing to, committed to ensuring equitable access uh, in public higher education in our state. Our recent study, Rising Barrier Drinking Aid, published earlier this year, um, illuminated a pressing concern for our students, the intricacy of our state financial aid system. What we observe is that the two decades of decli declining investment in state grants and uh, scholarship hasn't just reduced the ability to counterbalance the soaring college expenses, but in a good effort to optimize the limited funds, the state has created over 40 small overlapping grants, scholarship and tuition waivers. So while we know this is well intentioned, the outcome uh, is financial aid system that is dif increasingly difficult for many to understand, to navigate and to benefit from. This intricate maze unfortunately deters or adds additional hurdles for those seeking a higher education credential but have limited resources to navigate this complicated system. 
compounding the complexity of the system is the unclear financial aid uh, contribution that the students can have access to. So that makes it especially difficult for them to estimate how much financial aid uh, students will receive and what uh, the gap to cover for them is in terms of their unmet need, which of course, again, hits those from underprivileged background the hardest. So we are very encouraged uh, to see recent, recent efforts to increase the affordability of our higher education, such as, as you all know, the Reconnect initiative, the tuition-free nursing program, uh, the merit-based tuition-free high demand program that was established. While all this are good news, it does continue a pattern of layering these small new programs on top of existing one such as Mass Grant Plus, which already commits to covering the tuition and fees of students in a last dollar basis, so it further complicates the funding ecosystem. So that brings me to the legislation here that I came to support. It presents a much needed solution, streamlining, integrating approach to financial aid, uh, simplifying, centralizing the aid process will not only make it more accessible, but it will also strengthen the role and promise of higher education for everyone in Massachusetts. And so it's time that we kind of refine uh, our commendable intentions into a system that genuinely serves and uplifts all our students. So I respectfully urge the committee to back this bill and in doing so, champion a clearer, more equitable route for higher education for all our students and residents. So thank you so much for your um, consideration. Thank you so much for your testimony and your work at Hildreth, uh, which is really groundbreaking. Oh, there you are. We've been missing you. I didn't realize, I didn't realize it was not on, so sorry. No, no, it's OK. It's OK. We heard you perfectly. Um, Thank you, and thank you for the report that you issued that was so critical, I know, foundational for the committee. Uh, so thank you. I, any questions on this? Uh, we appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, next, uh, we have Hallie. Oh, Hallie. I didn't see you there. Hallie Kelly. Welcome. Thank you, and thank you for having this hearing. And also, thank you to Shauna for the work that um, you are doing for your granddaughter. Um, dear members of the Joint Committee on Higher Education, I am Haley Kelly, and I serve on the Democratic State Committee as the non-binary minority representative. Today, you have heard and will be hearing a lot of important reasons why we need to pass legislation to increase the affordability of our universities. The intersectionality of college affordability cannot be understated, and I would like to help everyone better understand its scope by offering another reason why these bills must pass. At last year's Democratic State Convention, the delegates passed a resolution on trans youth fleeing oppression with over 90% support. This resolution, which I had the honor of introducing, was written by transgender young adults who came here to ensure that their rights as people were secure. By decisively passing this resolution, the Democratic Party let the most impacted people define what policies are needed for Massachusetts to be a trans state state. We still haven't satisfied the policy requirements they laid out. The safe state laws that were passed last session for gender affirming and reproductive health care were important, but are unhelpful to a very large percentage of transgender and queer people trying to seek asylum in Massachusetts. If you're a young queer person, you likely don't have the resources to travel from Tennessee to Massachusetts on your own. That's why so many, if not the majority of trans people coming to blue states get here through our universities. According to the Trevor Project, two thirds of trans youth have transphobic parents. And predictably, many can't afford the high cost of moving to Massachusetts because they are teenagers. They must spend years in the closet having their mental health destroyed in the hope that when they can finally apply for colleges, they can convince their family to pay for them to come to this part of the country. Only once they're here, they are finally safe, assuming that their parents don't find out they're queer 
or are wealthy enough to scrounge together at least $120,000 a year while going to college full time. Understanding the role that universities play in transgender asylum forces one to recognize the fact that college affordability is one of the main barriers to making this a safe state for queer youth. If your family is economically privileged enough to afford expensive out-of-state tuition, then Massachusetts is a safe state. If you can't <coughs> afford it, or your mental health is too damaged by trauma to both work and attend college full-time, as is the case for many, then we are not a safe state, and in many instances, we are condemning you to death. If the members of the Massachusetts General Court want to say that we are a safe state, then we must be a safe state for everyone, for all queer refugees, regardless of economic class, not just the most well-off among us. Um, increasing college affordability is a requirement for Massachusetts to become a safe state. This isn't radical. This is the mainstream position of the Massachusetts Democratic Party, as declared by well over nine out of 10 delegates. Please help save the lives of queer youth and report the bills H1261 slash S13, H3761, and S835 favorably. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony and for taking the time to come into Boston and talk about these three really important bills. Um, and I'm not sure how you find enough time in the day to do everything you do, Haley, <laughs> um, honestly. I'm grateful for also your engagement with the Democratic Party in terms of you know, just holding um, ideals there as well. Thank you. Um, questions for the, from the committee? Right, I don't see any. Thank you. I, I was looking at notes um, that we had received, so uh, very grateful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We appreciate you. Next up is James Gannon, please. We don't give you very much notice. No rush. <coughs> Thank you all. Appreciate it. Um, I was here back in July and participated in the fire drive. It was fun. Um, as noted, my name is James Gannon. I'm a 68 year old resident of North Brighton, Massachusetts, and I am a student at Middlesex Community College. Cambridge, gentlemen, that's where I grew up. Two years ago, I applied for a categor categorical senior citizen tuition waiver and discovered the tuition waiver covers less than 10% of the cost of attending Massachusetts institution of higher education. Campus fees are not included in the categor categorical tuition waivers and make up 90% of the fees, excuse me, the total cost. Institution may waive specific and or reduced fees for in various categorical waivers. Some do. Middlesex Community College is one of those. Most do not. <clears throat> UMass, with 75,000 students enrolled annually, have granted 24 waivers for each of the last five years. The DHE stated that the number of waivers granted at non-UMass institutions is, quote, a relatively low number. Chapter 15A, categorical tuition waivers, are of Massachusetts senior citizens. Massachusetts ranks last in New England. We're fighting Rhode Island for that last spot. <clears throat> As an example, the state of Maine offers one class per semester free and a 50% discount for certain classes. In the United States, Massachusetts ranks in the bottom 10% of providing low or no cost tuition to its senior citizens. Texas, excuse me, California, $1 per class. Texas, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Wyoming, and the list goes on and on. All offer low cost and no cost options to their higher education institutions. The source for that information is Harvard University. Massachusetts Reconnect is and has been a great start to providing some equity to Massachusetts senior citizens. But with the limitation that it is for community colleges only, and you must not have a previous degree and or certificate. Those two limitations. Today, 29 states offer free community colleges last dollar to all of their residents, 29. And there are no senior citizen advocates on the Massachusetts Board of Higher Education or the UMass Board of Trustees. For the last two years, I've sat in on all of the meetings and the subject has never come up except for 
Chevy Gabrielli allowed me to speak once. Massachusetts undergraduate enrollments are currently at more than a 20 year low. From a peak of 197,000 in 2013, we are now at 147,000 full time equivalents in 2022. Sorry. Um, I'll go quicker, I promise. Um, that's not COVID related at all. Put another way, that's half a million once occupied seats. That are, excuse me, that is half a million once occupied seats that are, that are now empty seats. Every semester, there are thousands of empty seats at Massachusetts Public Colleges and Higher Education. The cost for a senior citizen, the cost for a senior citizen to occupy one of those seats is $20 per credit hour. Um, it is estimated, and I'll skip this section here, it is estimated that there will be a 15 to 20% decline in enrollments in Massachusetts public and private colleges by the end of the decade. Now is the time to open the public higher education doors to Massachusetts senior citizens and make it beneficial for both the institutions and Massachusetts senior citizens. To be perfectly honest, honest it is just good business. Last line, that maintaining the status quo is telling many senior citizens Thank you, James. Um, you had a lot of facts in your testimony. Did you support? Did you submit that um, testimony to the committee? It's actually six pages, and I cut it down. I, I can six I can't do that. I will do that. Yeah. I, I do want to take a second to thank Jim Gabriel. He has been very supportive, um, and um, I actually um, also want to thank Greg Jones for his very supportive as well. That's but wonderful. I, I can't do that would be great, especially the Harvard study that you quoted um, in terms of what other states are doing yes. for uh, elder tuition and fees. That, I think that would be very helpful for us. Well, what's interesting in that, what's interesting in that study is Massachusetts this thing is providing free tuition for senior citizens, and that's true. The problem is, is tuition is only 10% of the cost. Um, and so, and, and that, and, and if, you, if, you, if you have an opportunity to look at the, the document that you has that you need to that you need to fill out. Um, it's 20 years old because it doesn't get used very often, and it still requires a notary, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. That's that interesting. That is, thank you. Questions from the committee? Okay. Thank you so much, thank you. James. Appreciate, appreciate your testimony. Uh, welcome, Senator Moore. Ooh, right on time. You're just going to another person. I thought I was late. No, no, never late, Mike. Thank you, uh, both Chairman and the committee for taking me out of order. So I am here today to speak on Senate 839, which is an act to assist low-income student success through work study. Uh, Senate 839 reflects essential work done by this committee and the legislation to expand access to higher education this bill focusing on, focusing on the important pieces of that mission outside the classroom. While discussions of access can often focus on the equity and affordability of entrance into a classroom, higher, edu higher education experience has also encompassed a broader practice. Success in the classroom is an obvious piece, but it is still impossible to understate the relevance so often lead to directly employment opportunities after graduation. While some schools offer assistance to find and succeed in these programs, too often these positions are reliant on connections based on family, friends, and wealth. Whether this is due to the lack of relevant personal networks or the inability of certain students to work at an unpaid position, this harms our students, our communities, and our economy. Too many students of color and those from low-income backgrounds are forced to miss out on these important opportunities to experience a workplace and build the networks necessary to succeed. As part of our broader mission to uplift these students, we must make internships and work studies available to all. This bill would establish a Career Pathways Work Study Trust Fund to help stabilize, excuse me, to subsidize the cost of work studies for students enrolled in the Commonwealth's community colleges. The Trust Fund would also help students and support them in their educational opportunity coordinator through the Mass Association of Community Colleges. The goal is to place at least one such coordinator on each of the community college campuses who can assist the students with career planning, accessing financial aid, and identifying a program of study. In addition, the coordinator will help address other graduation barriers like child care and transportation costs that hold too many of our students. The focus of these coordinators will be to help students receiving cash assistance through transition assistance with 
trust fund will help fund internships that would otherwise be unpaid and thus inaccessible to students who have families that rely on their income to get by. The bill also establishes protections so these monies will not be counted against a student or family's income requirements and jeopardize any student or federal cash assistance. Finally, the bill promotes the use of MOUs between colleges and local employers to establish meaningful and stable pathways for these students to benefit from such programs well into the future. But I respectfully ask for your support for this, um, this legislation and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Senator Moore, for your long leadership in public higher education. Uh, questions from the committee? I, ha I have a question. Sure. Um, actually, two questions. One is, so it sets up, so the bill sets up this program and then it funds it. And the funding would be especially dedicated to internships or work opportunities that are unpaid currently. But it could also help students get paid internships. Correct, so it's yes. Two. Yes, so one of, yes, this fund would help pay for internships that might now, right now might be unfunded. Um, so which we know that a lot of students don't have opportunities to those types of positions. Totally, I, I'm, I'm totally there. It's actually, it's one of the bones I have, you should know, that I get like, I get crazy when students who um, don't have academic, uh, don't have the opportunity to have unpaid internships. And, and if you think about it, um, this is not a knock or criticism about private institutions. But if, if you look at the um, foundations that they have um, for uh, graduate network, usually a lot of these networks are used to help students get internships or paid positions upon graduation or during, this, during their tenure at the school. We know our state universities and our community colleges don't have those same opportunities. So this could help replace that or supplement what, this, uh, our, uh, what our uh, public institutions have to offer our students. Do you have an initial funding level for this? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, so we'll put that aside. Second question. The success fund, which has, you know, sort of come up quickly at the community college level since you filed this bill, right? Yep. I think you filed it this session for the, no, last session last for the session first time. Last session for the first time, yes. So, but the success fund this session, it, you know, has been more robustly, um, uh, happily funded. Do you think that at a two-year institution, some of the work of success could be in the internships? I know success is not at the four-year institutions. I think, I think it could. Uh, I think the, 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 if you want to do the integration of both funds or working together on this, having a, a coordinator at each school, I think actually really would better utilize some of that funding, because now we've got someone working with each community college um, that knows the demographics of the of the region that they're serving. So utilizing the success fund in this, in the, the concept of the, of the coordinators, I think actually would be a great supplement to uh, this program. Yeah, and then we'd have to figure out the four years. Right, right. yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on now. Um, is uh, Henry Barbaro here? I think you're online, Henry. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, can, you can you hear me? I'm sorry. We just we had a, a tiny. I, I, I couldn't hear you initially. Are you here? Is this Henry? Yes. Okay, terrific. My camera. Is my camera working? Yeah, we see you perfectly. Awesome. Thank you. Um, well, my name is Henry Barbaro, and I live in Newton, and I thank you for this opportunity to testify on Senate Bills 817 and 836, and House Bill 1281, as well as House Bill 1279, and they all have to do with in-state tuition. But before I start, could the committee provide the deadline for submitting written comments? Is it, is it at the end of business today so thank you in uh, advance you know this committee is actually uh, very generous with our deadlines where we welcome your testimony whenever you can get it in sooner is good oh, that's, that's very nice I'll, I'll, I'll try to um, 
submitted a more comprehensive comments uh, by Lynn today. So what I wanted to say before the committee is that the United States and Massachusetts has recently, as you know, been suffering an immigration crisis. The social services of Massachusetts are being overwhelmed and Governor Healy has declared a state of emergency because of the lack of shelter that's available for migrants. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about legal or illegal immigration or how we define those terms. Massachusetts is facing a massive influx of migrants. In-state tuition <clears throat> will only serve to incentivize more mass migration into Massachusetts. Until Congress fixes the asylum loophole and Massachusetts legislature fixes the right to shelter law, the legislature should not be creating yet another magnet for mass migration to our state. These in-state tuition bills <clears throat> also are unfair to those citizens of the United States and legal immigrants who would need to pay out-of-state tuition here in Massachusetts. This bill incentivizes more migration to Massachusetts, mostly for people who will be in the United States for years before their asylum claims are heard and likely denied by an immigration judge. I urge the Committee on Higher Education to not approve the in-state tuition bills, Senate Bills 817 and 836 and House Bill 1281. On the other hand, Passing House Bill 1279 would codify the responsible and fair approach for determining eligibility of in-state tuition rates. Thank you again for considering my testimony. And I just want to mention that a colleague of mine, David Holtzman, is on the line. He's not sure if he registered to testify correctly. So if you have the ability to call on him, that'd be very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Henry. Uh, and we see your colleague, David. Uh, he, we're, we're about five away from him. Um, Thank you. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. We welcome your written comments. One uh, significant clarification, which I offered at the beginning of the hearing, and forgive me, I didn't offer it again as we started this bill. Um, the in-state tuition for undocumented students is now law. Um, it requires students to have graduated from Commonwealth um, high schools and have lived in the Commonwealth for three years. Um, but it's, it's an in-state opportunity to pay in-state prices um, for colleges. Right. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, next up, please, John Thompson. Thank you, John. Massachusetts has a very low fertility rate. We cannot maintain our own, trans, uh, our own uh, labor force based on natural population. This is similar to other parts of the country, but we are an extreme case. We are not anywhere in the middle. We are one extreme. Things could be done to uh, encourage family formation. I won't go into that. Uh, we also have many
hospitable environment for those who are trying to work themselves up or have achieved a measure of stability and find out that the, the environment in the state does not help them to realize their ambitions for the future. On the other hand, we in the state have the largest, in absolute terms, the largest increase in illegal migrants in the entire country. This has occurred mostly since 2008, which is the, uh, the at which was the peak of illegal migration. But states like California and uh, Arizona have uh, been experiencing decreasing. Uh, illegal uh, population, and we have been, we have tripled ours from 100,000 in the year 2007 to about 300,000. Uh, almost 5% of the state's uh, po uh, population at this time. We have the most generous level of payments, second, no, second most. Hawaii has the most. We have 7,400, that is the amount of benefits received by each. Uh, unlawful migrant, and uh, they pay, because of their socioeconomic characteristics, they pay very little in taxes. Uh, this, uh, just looking forward, this means that we will be able not to, not be able to maintain our infrastructure, and we will not, and things such as, uh, we will, the quality of the labor force, one of our strengths historically will disappear. Uh, Thank you uh, so much. Okay, yeah, I just, uh, just let me say two more things. Two more oh, things, and then okay. we're finished. Up to now, you could say this is all because we're very compassionate. And let me uh, let me tell you why we're not as compassionate as we would ha have you believe. The t decline in the wages of the lowest twenty percent of workers in this state has been—it's been bad all over the country, and it's been sharpest in Mass Massachusetts. That's thing one. Secondly. Uh, People have been leaving, prime age workers have been leaving the workforce uh, in record numbers. And Massachusetts is the highest, uh, um, among the highest, way skewed at the end. So we have a system that uh, discourages family formation, encourages outmigration, encourages uh, the influx of people who are uh, not going to contribute financially and it really Thank you drive for down your the wages of natives and, okay, any questions? Thank you so much. That? I have no questions, just two comments. One, you offered us a, a number of facts. I'd love to see those substantiated. I will um, substantiate any, if you ask good. me, if, I and will substantiate everything I've said here. Very good. But you if can you have send another question, I will I'm going to submit written testimony yep. and I will substantiate some that of as the, well. Some of what you've offered is a bit dissonant from what I understand. The second thing I just want to say, just uh, I'm going to take a point of privilege as chair. I really appreciate our governor and lieutenant governor um, in grappling uh, with what we face as a commonwealth and our legislature, Senate and House leadership. Um, and I do believe um, the folks who are coming to the commonwealth are the future of the commonwealth. And the folks who are leaving, because as you say, it's inhospitable, public higher education, investing in public higher education and early education and housing prices uh, and child care. That's all part of making uh, Massachusetts a worthwhile and affordable place to live. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I agree we have work to do um, well, to, make it a, to make it a better place to live for everyone. Well, um, the people thank you who, so much. Um, a lot of people are voting with their feet to say that they disagree and, with you. And we have more to do to keep them here. Um, and honor their contributions. Thank you so much. We appreciate your testimony. Next up, please, Steve Cropper. May not be here. Okay, we'll catch Steve on the flip side if he's here. Next up, please. Oh, David Holtzman. I believe we know that you're coming in. I believe you might be muted. Are you muted? I'm afraid we can't hear you, David. You, you're talking, but we can't hear you. Elias, can you ask David to unmute? Is that possible?
David, the unmute button is at the bottom of your screen. It's like Zoom, you just press the little microphone. so much I appreciate you we can also call in we could send David a call-in number okay while we sort this out mindful of everybody's time um, I'm going to go to Alexander Is Alexander here Pavlova Gillum I'm so sorry, Pavlova Gillum. We're in a funny place in this hearing. Okay. Is Alexander online? No, that's no in person. Oh, Alexander, you'd prefer not to testify? You are totally fine. And you can submit written comments. Um, and thanks to the committee, you yes. Some, or you can talk to us afterwards and we're happy to hear your testimony. Anything you need to do. Democracy should not be painful. Although we're having painful technical issues. Yeah. David, are you with us? He still has been silent. We're having a painful interface. LIS, I'm sorry. Luke. Luke. Luke, bless your heart. Um, Perhaps try to put the call-in number in the chat for Teams. Is the chat enabled? No. It looks like he's trying to dial in now. He's got the phone. Okay. We're going to hope to hear from David by phone. Thank you for your work. waiting for David. Is there anybody here who signed up to testify who wants to testify? I'm looking at you in the back. No? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Madam mind? Chair, can you hear me? Oh, go. David. Okay. No, this is this is Henry Barbaro. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to help David. Um, you would like him to call in? Henry, yes. Luke from LIS sent a number. All right, he's he's not the most high tech guy. Could could I have the number and I'll call him to call you? Um, you know, uh, did did Luke? Did you put it in chat? Oh, okay. All right, it's coming in chat. Uh, just because we're holding up the hearing, um, I'm also happy to hear from David directly. We can schedule a phone call for sure. Um, Luke is putting in the number for a call into the chat oh yeah I, okay all right I, i'll wait for it I, I have the chat box open sorry about this delay please it's, no sorry you're very kind in giving uh cutting david some slack <laughs> we've all been there <laughs> Oh, I see it. Great. 617-865-5269. All right. Terrific. There's probably also All right, a passcode. Gonna... Oh, God. Oh, there's... oh, there's a passcode as well? Yes. Luke will have oh. had to put in. We may need to abandon ship here. So if I call this number, I won't just directly get a hold of you. Um, so what that number is is it's a it's an interface number to uh, the Teams. This it's like Zoom that we're using yes. to be able to have people come in um, remotely. So yes. 
what it will do is it will allow David to call into that rather than unmute his um, his computer. He should be right. able to unmute. We see him. He should. I be know. I try. I try to coach him. Well, you okay. know, at right afterwards, but. I'm, I'm not as I'm not at his desk, so I'm just not sure what he's dealing with. But it's okay. I'll, I'll I'll give him a call right now. All right, we're going to wait for a couple of more minutes, and then we may just have to bring the hearing to a close. And I, you have my word that I will speak. I will take a call personally um, to be able to hear the testimony. Thank you. Okay, we're going to wait uh, two minutes. So the hearing is going to be adjourned for two minutes, uh, and when we come back. Um, we will see if we can hear from David. Thank you. The, higher ed the Joint Committee on Higher Education is back in session. Uh, I'm afraid that we have not been able to solve technological difficulties for the last person signed up to testify. Um, and therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to conclude this hearing. And again, uh, the chairs are more than happy to meet individually um, with anyone who testified today, but especially someone who uh, had technological difficulties. Uh, because your voices are really important. Um, so with that, uh, and with apologies that the technology is just not working in our favor for this individual, um, we're going to bring this hearing to a conclusion.